So as I was thinking this week as to how to conclude this kind of impromptu doctrine series throughout the month of June, we've kind of looked at different doctrines, different aspects of the Christian life and of the, the, the way that we are saved, the way we are to live. And as I thought about the way to end this today, before we jump back into Luke next week, I was thinking about this word, hope. You know, as I share the gospel as a part of my sermons, uh, I normally will say something to the effect of, because of Jesus' perfect, sinless life, His sacrificial death for our sins in our place, and His glorious resurrection, as a result of all this, we have hope for this life, and for the life to come. And this word hope is kind of central to to at least the way I think about the good news of the gospel. As a matter of fact, this word hope has been central to the conversation about the good news of Jesus going all the way back to the New Testament. As you read through the New Testament, through the gospels, and through the letters, you see that hope is a central idea. For the past 2,000 years, the people of God have been thinking about what it means to have hope. As I think back, not 2,000 years, but 500 years in the 16th century, the writers of the Heidelberg Catechism began their summary of the Christian faith with this question. What is your only hope in life and in death? What is your only comfort or hope in life and in death? And I think they were getting at this central theme that we know, right? You see, they understood, they realized that as humans, we need hope. At the center of our Christian belief is the understanding that we need hope in something outside of ourselves. We need someone to save us. So this morning I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians and look at what is the Christian hope. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip to 1 Corinthians 15. But as you're going there, let's pray once again and ask God to bless His Word. Lord, as we open Your Word to seek to understand what it says, Lord, remind us of Your truth. Lord, may through the the reading and the preaching of your word, may your people be built up. Lord, may we be encouraged. May we be convicted of sin where the sin is present. And Lord, may we be motivated to go and face a world that is broken. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians beginning in verse 5 or 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning in verse 12 we read this Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead If there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised And if Christ has not been raised then our proclamation is in vain And so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Verse 20. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in its own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterwards, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then, in the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power, he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. 
Now, when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. This is the word of the Lord. As humans, we innately know, at least if we're honest with ourselves, that this world is broken. That there's something about our lives and the society we live in that is askew. And we know that, they, that we have a need for comfort, for hope. As one author put it, he defined hope as a confident expectation of a good outcome. Friends, it is natural and good for us to desire a solution to the problems of this life. You see, the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism that we began with understood this, right? They understood that there was a problem. They understood that we needed hope in life and in death. And I think in their answer we'll read later that that they summarize 1 Corinthians 15 well. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is laying out the gospel. We didn't read the first section, but in verses 3 through 8, Paul really lays out what exactly the gospel is that Jesus came, that he died, that he rose again, that he has paid the penalty for our sins, that he is truly alive, that he appeared to the apostles and ultimately to Paul. But as you continue on in chapter 15, the section we just read, we see that Paul not only lays out what the gospel is, not only the good news about Jesus, but how that same gospel impacts the life of the Christian. See, apparently in Corinth, there were some who were saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. Even though they had heard the good news of the gospel, even though they had heard the proclamation that Christ had died and been raised, even though they knew the hope that was offered through the work of Jesus, they were still denying that the dead are raised. They might have said something to the effect effect of life is short and then you die and then there's nothing. Yet, Paul communicates here. He argues in this passage that because of the gospel, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have a real and living hope. This gospel that Paul proclaimed, this gospel that is powerful to save, that's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 too, this gospel offers a truth, a hope that is not for this life only, but also for the life to come. Paul argues here in negative terms in in verses 12 through 19. Look at it there. He says that if the dead are not raised, if there is no hope beyond the grave, then Christ himself has not been raised. He says if you're going to say that the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised. And he says in verse 19 that if we have hope in Christ for this life only, if this life is all that there is, then we as Christians are most to be pitied. We should be pitied more than anyone if we have put our hope only in God for this life then what have we really done but instead Paul argues that our hope is not for this life only no we believe in a God who is not only real a God that not only created the world a God that not only interacts with his creation all of this is true and good and glorious but we also believe in a God who is in the business of raising the dead We believe in a God who has given us the good news about Jesus that includes not only good news for this life, but also for the life to come. The gospel, the good news about Jesus, includes hope not only now, but also for our future. Paul says that if it is true that the dead are not raised, then our faith is futile, and we're still in our sins. Friends, the Christian hope is that our current state, the world is at is now is not all there is the christian hope is that the life of christ in his resurrection is a foretaste of the life that we will all have that christ's resurrection is a picture a a image of what we will all experience that we will be raised like christ that all the evil in this world will be done away with look at verse 22 or i'm sorry verse 20 
He says, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Friends, the assurance is that just as Christ has been raised, we will also be raised. That just as He was free from the, from the weight of guilt of sin and its penalty death, that we also will be. He says that just as death has come through one man, just as we are in Adam in that we bear His nature, that we sin like Adam, we are under the same condemnation of Adam. And that is death. He says, just like we are in Adam, if we are in Christ, then we will also experience the life that is in Christ. Just as death came through one man, Adam, so life comes through one man, Jesus Christ. Paul tells us that the Gospel gives us hope. A confident assurance that Though now we are redeemed and still struggle with sin and even die in this life, we have a hope that is beyond the grave. And Paul addresses this explicitly in verses 23 through 28. Look, let's read that again. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterwards at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. Now when he says everything is put under him, it is obvious that the one who puts everything under him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him. So that God may be all in all. Here we see the truth. This might be a little bit confusing, a little bit dense language, but here is in essence what Paul is saying. The Christian hope is that God is ruling and reigning and that He is bringing everything into subjection under Christ. Let me put that another way. The hope of the Gospel is that God fulfills His promises. That God will do away with all the brokenness, all the sin, all death, all evil in the day of Christ. This is the day the prophets in the Old Testament talk about as the day of the Lord. The day when God will make all things new, when He will do away with all evil and sin and death. And we with Christ will be raised. Friends, our hope is in the day when God makes all things new. This passage shows us our hope. The hope is in God who is ruling and reigning now and will continue to rule and reign in the future. Our hope is in the day when all things will be made new, when all creation will bow at the feet of Christ, when God will destroy sin and death. Friends, the Christian hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Christian hope is that Jesus lived a perfect life sinless obedient before the father that he died a death for our sins in our place taking the punishment that you deserved and that i deserved upon himself and that when he had satisfied for the debt that we owed he rose from the dead showing that the payment was complete not only that but he also in his resurrection gives us a picture of our future state That we too will be raised from the dead. Will be new creations where sin will not shackle us any any longer. Where we no longer have to face the consequence of death. Friends, our hope is in Jesus Christ. In the life given to us by the Spirit. Our hope is in the day that we read about in Revelation 22. When all that is under the curse of sin will be done away with. When all of our struggles, all of our brokenness, all of the calamity of this life will be done away with. Friends, the Christian hope, the confident assurance we have of a positive outcome is found in the person of Jesus Christ and His sacrificial death and glorious resurrection that gives us hope that if we are in Him, then we too will know this. So, you might be there and saying, Daniel, that all sounds great. I believe it, God's Word says it, but I'm here and now, and I'm struggling here and now. I want to know, is there any hope for me here and now? Our hope is the person and work of Jesus Christ and His resurrection, but how does that hope change us? How does our hope in Jesus change the way we are here 
end now? Well, let me give you a few ways. Friends, this hope changes our spiritual life. You see, you and I are affected by our sins. Because of our sins, we cannot be in the presence of a holy God. That's the whole truth of the gospel, right? Friends, the hope of Jesus Christ gives us an assurance that the sin that once weighed so heavily on us, the debt that we owe that separates us us from God is gone. The hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a hope, a confident assurance that we will have eternal life with God. It is secure because it is complete in the work of Jesus Christ. This hope in Jesus Christ assures us that even though our, our earthly bodies are brokenness and subject to decay and death due to our sins and the sins committed by our first parents, Adam and Eve, it gives us an assurance that that penalty will not be forever. Friends, because of this hope, we can rest secure in Christ in our spiritual lives, knowing that the greatest problem we face, our sin, our failings, our shortcomings, are paid for and complete in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is a gospel hope. It affects the way we live now. Friends, this hope shows us that we don't have to be good enough to get God's favor, but that God's grace has been given to us even though we don't deserve it. How does this hope affect us here and now? It affects the way we live our spiritual lives, the way we worship. How does this hope affect us now? Well, it changes the way we work. The way we work is different because we have the hope of the gospel. Why? Friends, because we have the hope that Jesus Christ has come and lived a perfect life and died in our place and offers us the hope of resurrection, it changes the way we work. How? It gives us the freedom to work as for the Lord and not for men. It gives us the freedom to work hard and well because we know that our lives are not dependent upon or defined by our work. Friends, our work in our jobs, in the, in, the, in the marketplace, our work in our families, in our communities ought to be good and quality work. Why? Because it is an act of worship to God. Because of the hope we have in the gospel, we can obey what God's word says when it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might as working for the Lord and not for men. Friends, because of the hope of the gospel, our work looks differently because we know that we are not defined by it. Because we know that our work is not our Savior. It is unable to save us. The almighty dollar is not able to save us. A perfectly clean and orderly house and home will not save us. A position on the top of the company or on the top of the industry will not save us. Friends, because of the hope we have in Jesus Christ, we work differently. Because we see our work as an act of worship and not as something that we do to define ourselves. Friends, this hope affects our relationships because we know that our relationships will not save us. We work hard in our relationships to honor God, to obey His Word, but we realize that our hope is not in our spouses, our children, our pastors, or our presidents. The only hope we have is in the person of Jesus Christ who died for us. The hope we have is in the Father who has chosen us before the foundation of the world. Our hope is in the Spirit who gives us life, who sanctifies us and indwells us. Friends, our hope must be in God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we put our hope in sinful humans, they will let us down. If we put our hopes in our jobs that fluctuate with seasons and demands and markets, they will let us down. How does this hope change us? It changes us because our hope is not a moving target. Our hope is secure. It is in our eternal God who does not change. But let me get a little more specific. How does this hope change us? Going back to the question I asked earlier. Daniel, that all sounds great, but how does this affect me here and now? Friends, this hope in the gospel changes the way that we struggle. It changes the way that we struggle. It reminds us that our hope is not in the here and now. Our hope is in the life to come. It is a hope 
that is given to us here and now. I believe God can heal. And I believe that God also grants contentment. Friends, the hope that we have in Christ changes the way we struggle. Hear what Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 8. He says in in chapter 8 of Romans, beginning in verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself would be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, will groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in the hope, that is in this hope that we are saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purposes. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. Friends, this hope we have in Christ affects the way we struggle. Why? Because we know that it's okay that we struggle. If we have our hope in Jesus Christ who is going to make all things new, then we can rightly grieve the fact that everything is not as it should be now. We recognize that the brokenness, the pain that we experience now is not God's plan, that it is because of the sin in our world. And we can struggle with the hope of the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses. We can struggle with hope because the light at the end of the tunnel for us is not a nice thought that we use to comfort ourselves. No. We know that for those who are in Christ, the end of the road is to be in the very presence of God forever and ever. Because God's truth never changes. So, what should we do? How should we live in light of this hope? The first is the truth I say every week, right? We're to repent. To return from the false hopes that we've placed our trust in. Whether it's work, family, or security, politics, comfort. We repent of the false things we have put our hope in, the idols that we have given ourselves to. And instead we turn and put our trust in Jesus Christ, the God who has saved us, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we seek to live our lives growing in Him. Growing into the person that God has called us to be. To devote ourselves to be with Him. To study His Word. To pray. To be around Christians who can spur us on to greater and greater hope in Christ. The authors of the Heidelberg Catechism got it right. They began with this question, right? What is thy only comfort in life and in death? What's your only hope in life and in death? They answered it this way. I think Paul sums it up well in 1 Corinthians. This is what they said. That I with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with His precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins, and delivered me from the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life, and makes me sincerely 
ready and willing henceforth to live unto Him. Friends, our hope in life and in death is that Jesus has saved us. That through His perfect life, His sacrificial death, and His glorious resurrection, we have hope not only for this life, but also for the life to come. So today, as we sing, I'm going to invite Trey and and Evelyn to come as we prepare to respond. I want to invite you today to ask God to show you the things that you've put your hope in that are not Him and to turn from those. To trust Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is a solid foundation, a hope that never changes. And today I want to invite you to respond. I'll be here if you'd like to pray together. You can come and pray here at the front. Pray in your seat. I would invite you today once again be reminded of the hope that is in Christ. Put your faith in Him and rest securely. Let's pray together. Father, we confess that Lord, there are things in our lives that we put our hope in that are not You. Lord, I confess that, that too often I have found myself clinging on to things that can, can never really save. Lord, putting hopes in things that are fleeting. So Lord, would you forgive me? Lord, would you show us those false hopes that we, those false items we put our hope in? And Lord, help us to day after day, more and more, to trust in you. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray.